It's good to be back in uh, Crown Point. Uh, I always love to come to renewals here. Uh, it kind of feels like a second, you brethren, for me. And I want to thank you, brethren, for hosting us again this year. My text is Isaiah chapter 61. If you'd like to turn in your scriptures there with me, we'll be reading the first four verses. Isaiah chapter 61. The topic is the one anointed to preach. Isaiah 61, 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes." the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Then, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Amen. Isaiah the prophet was speaking in this text about himself, these, this is a passage that is a prophecy that has two layers of meaning. And if you know much about Old Testament prophecy, you probably know that many of the ancient prophecies had two layers of meaning. The first layer was the historical part, where the prophet was usually speaking about something in his time. And in this text, it's no different. There, the prophet Isaiah is speaking about his own ministry. Isaiah was anointed to preach. And as a prophet, he did what most prophets did, and that was preach. If you were called to be a prophet of God, the main function of a prophet was to preach the word of God. Prophets received the word of the Lord directly, firsthand from the Lord, and it was their calling and responsibility to deliver the word of God directly to the people exactly as they received it. In fact, most of what we have in the prophets was probably spoken in some form before it was written. So Isaiah here is, first of all, speaking about himself. He was anointed to preach as a prophet of God. But of course we know, and this is the purpose of this renewal, we know that this is also a prophecy about our Lord Jesus. Like Isaiah was called and anointed with the Holy Spirit to preach the word of the Lord, Jesus would also be anointed with the power of the Spirit and sent to preach the word of God. So that's the double meaning, the double layer here in this prophecy. Not only is it Isaiah speaking about himself, but he's also looking forward to the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, he began to preach. And one of the, one of the most important things that Jesus did, one of the most important reasons why he came into this world was to preach the word of God. In fact, he is the word. He's the word made flesh. And so you would expect the Word to say something. And indeed he did. When our Lord began his ministry, he began a ministry of preaching the Word of God. Now, when you look at these Old Testament passages, as many of the brethren have already done, it's always good to look and see in the New Testament if there is a direct fulfillment of the prophecy that you're considering. So if you want to keep your finger in Isaiah 61 and turn with me to Luke chapter 4, this passage does indeed have a, a very direct fulfillment. At the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus is tempted. And there's a couple phrases that I want you to note here in this, in this passage. The chapter begins this way. Jesus, now notice this, full of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what Isaiah said would happen? He would be anointed with the Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus went out of the wilderness. He was tempted by the devil. You know the story. You know what happened. Three temptations. Strike one, strike two, strike three. Satan, you're out. And he successfully resisted the devil. And it says in verse 13, he left him until an opportune time. Then look what it says again in verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee. What's it say? In the power of the Spirit. Again, alluding back to our prophecy, he would be anointed with the Spirit. Earlier in chapter 3, 
Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Do you remember what happened? The heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended out of heaven like a dove upon him. And at that point, I believe that was the direct fulfillment. That was when he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power to begin his public ministry, a public ministry of preaching. And then later in chapter 4, Jesus went home. He went back to his hometown of Nazareth. He entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he read, and guess what his text was? Isaiah 61. And he read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, verse 18, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it to the attendant, sat down, and, all, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. So far, so good. So far, Jesus was a hit in his hometown. In the next verse, it says, all were speaking well of him and wondering the gracious words that fell from his lips. And then Jesus looked around at all of the hometown folks, many of whom he had probably grown up around, and knowing their hearts, he took out a knife and he sliced them open. Because Jesus knew that the people listening to him that day in the synagogue of Nazareth had no intention of receiving him as the Messiah. They were filled with unbelief, And Jesus went on with his sermon, and the rest of his sermon there in the synagogue that day didn't go so well. Because Jesus said, you know what, I'm kind of paraphrasing Jesus if I can, respectfully. Jesus said to them something like this, you all are just like your ancestors. Your unbelief is just like your ancestors. Because you remember the time in Israel when Elijah the prophet was speaking for God, and God sent Elijah to a woman in Sidon. And you remember when Elisha was the next prophet in line, and things weren't any better in Israel then either, and God sent Elisha to a Syrian named Naaman. And things went downhill pretty quickly after Jesus said that. He was making Gentiles better than Jews, and they'd heard enough. They got so angry, it says there in Luke, that they they drug him outside, and they, they intended to take him outside of town and throw him off a cliff on which the town of Nazareth was built. Preaching can be a dangerous fashion. Now, I I know we've got some preachers here. How many of you have ever been thrown off a cliff? Uh, How many of you have, has has anybody ever attempted to throw you off a cliff? Uh, I've, I've ticked off some people in sermons, but that has never happened to me. But it happened to Jesus. And preaching can be a dangerous profession when you tell people things that they don't want to hear. I have a very difficult assignment because in this message, what I really want to do, I want to preach about preaching. (laughs) I don't know, you've probably never heard a sermon where the preacher actually preached about preaching, but that's, that's what I want to do tonight from this passage. One thing that I don't want to do, however, is to just have, just bring you some sort of academic lecture on preaching. I don't want this to turn into a Bible lecture about preaching. Uh, I know we've got some men here who are ministers in churches behind pulpits every week. And sometimes ministers like to hear lectures about preaching. And there are a lot of ministers that suffer from what I would call the disease of professionalism. And they enjoy listening to lectures on preaching so that they can learn some kind of new tip to go home and try in their congregation. The professional preachers sometimes look for those kinds of things. And I, I don't want to bring you anything like that. I don't, I don't agree with that kind of professionalism in the pulpit. Amen. There's nothing wrong with being a professional preacher and making a living from the gospel. But that kind of professionalism of just looking for some kind of trick to use in the pulpit is something that the people of God should, should despise. So that's not what I want to do. I'm not going to give, I'm going to preach about preaching, but I'm not just going to talk to those of you who preach. I also want to address those of you who listen to preaching on a regular basis. 
And for those of you who don't preach, who are not professionals, perhaps, I want you to understand a couple of things. First of all, even if you don't preach, you benefit from good preaching. And since that's the case, I want to talk about what makes for good preaching. And secondly, even if you don't preach from behind a pulpit every week on Sunday, and even if you don't make your living from the gospel, in a sense, you are also called to preach. All of us may be called upon at certain times to share the word of God with someone. So you may be in an opportunity where you are called upon perhaps to teach a class or maybe to share the gospel with a, an unsaved friend or family member or to, maybe to just encourage someone in the Lord. And there are going to be times, even if you're not a preacher, there are going to be times when you're going to need to be able to speak for the Lord. And so what I have to say uh, tonight is going to hopefully help you no matter where you're at. So I want to talk about preaching, and I want to use this prophecy from Isaiah to talk about preaching and how Jesus was the ultimate preacher. Would you agree with that? Would you agree that our Lord Jesus was the ultimate preacher? And all preachers should strive to be like him. In fact, all of us should strive to be like him. You're being conformed to his image. Uh, just something to those of you who do preach on a regular basis. Since Jesus is the ultimate preacher and since he's our example in all things, for those of us who do preach on a regular basis, let me just remind you that it's your job to try to be like Jesus in your own measure and not to just mimic some other preacher that you admire. All of us young guys, we have some older preacher that we've heard that has helped us, that we admire, and it's very easy for us to begin to mimic that man that has helped us. And for those of you who preach, let me just remind you that your goal is to be like Jesus. So strive, strive to be who you are in Christ. And someone once said that preaching is truth through personality. So let the truth of God flow through your unique personality. Don't just try to mimic someone else. Be who you are in Christ because there's something very powerful about truth coming through your personality. All right? Jesus is the ultimate preacher. So I want us to use Isaiah's prophecy and see some characteristics of true preaching, especially as those characteristics are demonstrated in the ministry of the ultimate preacher, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that everyone in the church seems to think of themselves as an armchair theologian. You've heard of armchair quarterbacks. Well, a lot of people in the church are kind of like armchair theologians, and most people think that they know what preaching's all about. Most church-going people think that they know a good sermon, they know a good preacher when they see it. And most people in the church really think of a good sermon as, you know, if the guy is, if he's engaging, uh, if he's interesting, if he's lively, if he tells a good story, tells a good joke, you know, has three points in a poem, most people leave church saying, you know, he's a pretty good, he's a pretty good preacher. And unfortunately, most people today really don't understand much about what the Bible says about preaching and how it's supposed to be done and what it's supposed to accomplish. We want to accomplish more than just being lively and interesting speakers. Now, I have nothing against lively, interesting preaching. It's a shame when preachers are dull and uninteresting. And it's a shame when preachers don't hold the attention of people. That's a shame. But you know, we live in a culture that is entertainment media driven. And there are a lot of really good speakers in this culture who are very adept at holding people's attention. But they're, they're, they're not preachers, of course. So preaching is more than just entertainment. It's more than just making people feel good or holding their attention or being interesting. Although we do want to be interesting and hold their attention. Don't get me wrong. We don't want to be sloppy. But there's so, there's so much more to preaching than just uh, some kind of entertainment, some kind of religious entertainment. And in this culture, a lot of preaching today, you know this is true, is really just entertainment. Yeah. It's polished public speaking. And I want us to try to think tonight about what really real preaching really is. Preaching goes far beyond entertainment in both its presentation and its content. So I want to ask this question tonight. 
how are we supposed to present the Word of God? Not just those of us who stand behind a pulpit, but, but all of us. How are we to present the Word of God? How are we to speak the Word of God? And what are we supposed to say? Let's take that first question first. How is the Word of God to be presented? Preaching is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Look back at our text. Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. So all true preaching, all true communication of the word of God is driven, is enabled, is empowered by the spirit of God. In fact, you can, you can recognize, if, if you're a believer, you can recognize when a preacher is really a preacher and not just a public speaker. Have you ever listened to a preacher? I know you have. We've all listened to preachers that we really could feel that there was a power behind what this man was saying. It, he wasn't just speaking, he was preaching the word and there was a, a, an invisible power and force behind what he was saying because the Holy Spirit was empowering what he was talking about. All the Old Testament prophets were filled with the Spirit and carried along by the Spirit. As I've already mentioned, Jesus himself began his public ministry of preaching in the power of the Spirit. All true preachers of God are recognized by having this mysterious power behind their speaking. The power was evident in our Lord. Someone noticed that Jesus speaks with authority and not as the teachers of the law. One time they, they sent the guards to arrest him and the guards came back and they didn't have Jesus and they said, why didn't you arrest him? No man spoke like that man did. There was something different about Jesus when he opened his mouth. There was something different about him. There was a mysterious power. He didn't have a degree from the rabbinical seminary, but there was a power there that he had that people, even the common people, recognized that power. He didn't, he didn't speak like the scribes. You know, the scribes had this annoying habit, like many preachers today, of quoting everybody in their sermons. You've probably heard a preacher do that who has to quote everybody else in, in, you know, in the sermon. Jesus didn't have to quote anybody. Everything that Jesus said had a directness and a freshness to it, as if Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. It had, a, it had authority and it had power and people recognized that there was something very different about Jesus. Now that is not to say that Jesus didn't quote other people. He did quote, he did use quotations, he quoted scripture. As you read about the preaching of Jesus in the gospels, you're constantly reading Jesus saying, it is written, the scripture says, and he would quote the scriptures. Jesus was not only anointed with the spirit, but he also preached the word of God. He quoted from the word of God. He took the people back to the scripture. Even when the scribes and the Pharisees wanted to disregard the scriptures for the sake of their traditions, what did Jesus do? Took them right back to the scriptures. You see, there's a, there's a link between the, the spirit and the word that makes for powerful, authoritative preaching even today. Now, I'm not saying that I have the spirit like Jesus had the spirit. I'm not, he had the spirit without limit. I don't have, this, I don't have that kind of capacity. And, I, and I'm not going to say that I'm some kind of prophet like Isaiah was. I, I don't get the word of the Lord directly to me. I go to the word. It doesn't come to me. But nevertheless, even today, there is a, there is a link in true preaching between the, the spirit and the written word. Those two things always go together and you can't, you can't separate those things. It was the combination of the spirit and the word that made Jesus' preaching so authoritative and that's the thing that makes preaching authoritative today. Amen. For example, even today, though I don't have the spirit without limit, though I'm not a prophet like Isaiah was, even today the spirit can give passion to the preacher. The Spirit can give passion to the preacher. Personally, I, this is just my opinion, and I've been known to be wrong once or twice in my life, but I don't think there is such a thing as a boring preacher. I've heard people say, you know, I, our pastor, he's, he, 
He's, he's a great guy, and he means well, but he's just kind of dry. He's kind of boring as a preacher. Well, if you're dry and boring as a preacher, you're not a, you may be a lot of things, but you're not a preacher. I don't think it's possible for a preacher anointed with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Word of God, to be dry and boring. I don't think that's possible. Amen. Jesus attracted great crowds of people. You don't do that by being dull. I can't imagine Isaiah the prophet or Ezekiel or Daniel being dull when they spoke the word of God. The Holy Spirit can give us a fire, a passion, a palpable enthusiasm when we speak the word of God. It's something that even transcends personality. I know that different men have different personalities and different ways of presenting themselves, but, but the spirit of God can use us as we are. And he can take a personality, there may, there may be someone, and some of you are, are sort of timid sometimes. And, and just in normal conversation, you don't say a lot, and you're very soft-spoken. But the, but the Holy Spirit can give you a holy boldness, and a strength, and a power. So that when you speak, you do, you do, I'm not telling you to fake it. There's nothing worse than some kind of preaching voice where it's faked. I'm not saying we fake it. But the Holy Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit, if you're filled with the Spirit, He can give you a passion and an enthusiasm for the Word of God so that when you communicate to other people, you're, you're enthusiastic about it. There's a passion that has been lit in your own soul. How dare we speak about the things of God in a casual manner? And I, I've, I've got to reprimand myself. I know that there are times when I get in the pulpit and I speak about these great eternal things in kind of a casual manner and my whole heart's not in it and I should be ashamed of myself. I think it was Richard Baxter, uh, the English Puritan preacher who used to scold himself for not being more passionate when he preached the word of God. We're talking about eternal things here. We're not talking about the sports page. And we, we need to be enthusiastic. Not, not some kind of fake enthusiasm where we just pump ourselves up. I'm talking about a passion that comes, that, a fire that is lit by the Holy Spirit of God. He can make us catch fire. Now, if you are a preacher and you preach regularly and you're not enthusiastic about your preaching, something's wrong. If you are in a church and your pastor, your minister, your preacher who preaches behind the pulpit on a regular basis, is not enthusiastic in his measure, okay? In his measure, if he's not enthusiastic, something's wrong. We need to be more enthusiastic about the things of God. You know, when people, when, when unbelievers look at the church, do you know one of the things that turns a lot of unbelievers off about the church is that they see Christians who aren't enthusiastic, who really don't mean business, who really don't seem to care about what we believe, and I know, people, I know people that come into my church, they come into my church and they just sit there and if, you, if they didn't blink, you'd think they were dead. I know there are people like this and shame on them. Shame on all of us for not being more enthusiastic. That's the flesh. I'm, I'm not talking about fanaticism and jumping over the pews and swinging from the lights or something like that. But they, they, these things ought to excite us and if they don't, then we need to repent. We need to rebuke the flesh because that's the flesh pulling us down. There's going to be an enthusiasm and a fire. Secondly, the Holy Spirit can give us illumination. The Holy Spirit can give illumination to the preacher. Now remember, you can't separate the word from the spirit. The spirit will illuminate our minds as we are saturating our minds with the scriptures. So you put the scripture in your mind if you're a preacher, or if you're, not, if you're just a, a person that just wants to share the word of God with someone else and you don't stand behind the pulpit, it doesn't make any difference. This applies to all of us. You put the word of God in your mind. You ruminate on it. You think about it. The Holy Spirit will come alongside you. He's the paraclete. He comes alongside, and, and he can help you to understand those things that you've read. Amen. Now, the Bible was inspired by the Spirit, wasn't it? He is actually the author of Scripture. And did you know the Holy Spirit lives in you? So the author of the Bible is living in us. Amen. So I believe that he can come alongside of us and he can help us to, to make connections and to bring things together in our minds so that we have an understanding of the Word of God. And frankly, I think probably 
that's the key to getting more excited about things. I, I know many of you, I've had this experience where I finally understood something, and boy, you just get excited when you, you understand something finally, and you make a connection. So the Holy Spirit can help us to make those connections and help us to understand the Word of God. That is the key to preaching. Preaching, true preaching, is a Illuminated by the Spirit, a true preacher has a spiritual understanding Amen. of God's Word. This goes beyond just a scholarly exegesis of the biblical text. A preacher may go to the text, he may exegete the text in a scholarly manner in order to understand the text, but spiritual illumination goes far beyond the conjugation of Greek verbs. Now, there are some preachers that probably should parse more Greek verbs just to be accurate. But there has been a trend in preaching in the last 20 or 30 years. There's been a trend in preaching. You probably heard the term expository preaching. And it's become very popular to think of a sermon as a, a guy gets the Bible and he says, let's study the Bible together. And he gets it out and he tells you this Greek word means this and this Greek verb has this ending. And that's supposed to be a sermon. That is not a sermon. Giving people Bible study notes is not a sermon. Giving people the exegesis of a passage is not a sermon. A sermon is born when a man has an understanding, a spiritual understanding of the text as it applies to people today. Not just the academic understanding of a passage. One preacher said a few years ago that no one comes to church to hear about the Jebusites. No one comes to church to hear Greek verbs or about the history of the Jebusites. But people will come to church to hear a word for them from the Lord one famous preacher said that a preacher who has given the meaning of the text in its original context has still not preached a sermon. He must give the spiritual meaning as it applies to his listeners today. Then it becomes a sermon. Only the Holy Spirit can take the dry bones of Greek and Hebrew exegesis and make those bones live and stand up to become a sermon. And the weakness of many pulpits today is that the dry bones of Bible study never really lives. And consequently, we have dry bones in the pews as well. So Jesus was filled with the Spirit when he preached. And preachers today should be filled with the Holy Spirit when they preach. The Spirit will give us both heat or enthusiasm and light or spiritual understanding. And even, again, even if you're not a preacher regularly behind a pulpit, you still need to walk in the Spirit. We still need to be filled with the Spirit. And he will give you passion for the work of the Lord. He will give you an understanding of spiritual things. Now, if you, if you are, I know many of you come from other churches. If you're sitting under a preacher who seems to lack fire and enthusiasm, seems to lack spiritual understanding, pray for that man, would you? Would you pray for that man that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit? Nothing is needed more today than preachers full of the Holy Spirit. So we've considered the delivery of the message. It should be delivered in the power and illumination of the Holy Spirit. Now we need to think about the content of the message. What are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to be preaching and teaching? What did Jesus talk about when he preached? Well, let's go back to our prophecy in Isaiah. It says in verse 1, The Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. So what is the content of our message? What are we supposed to be declaring? Good news. Good news. To bring good news to the afflicted. I think you know that the New Testament term gospel just means good news. We should all be thankful, brethren, that we have some good news to proclaim. Amen. You know, many of the Old Testament prophets that we've been referring to at this year's renewal, I don't envy a lot of their ministries because many of those brethren had some very bad news that they had to relay to the people of Israel. They had to talk a lot about the sin of the nation and the wrath of God that was going to come on them in judgment. And I don't, I don't always envy their ministries. We have, we have good news to proclaim. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we should soft sell the gospel. 
I'm not saying that we should pat it and that we should never talk about sin or judgment or wrath or hell. I'm not saying that. But the gospel is good news. And if we only preach negatively, if we're only just complaining about the world or preaching the old hellfire and brimstone stuff, if that's all we do, we're certainly unbalanced. There's a place for that. In fact, the background of God's wrath against sin is what makes the gospel shine. That's what makes it good news. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but I, but I want you to understand that the gospel is good news. Our preaching should be positive, not just complaining. You know, you've probably heard those sermons, ain't it awful, where you've heard a preacher get up and talk about, ain't it awful, things are bad today. Well, everybody knows that. That's no revelation at all. We have good news to proclaim. We need to be positive in our preaching. Did you know even that the vengeance of our God is good news? Did you notice there he mentions in verse 2, and the day of vengeance of our God? You know, that can even be good news. Did you know even the wrath of God can be good news? Because there's going to come a day when God is going to rip evil out of this world. Amen. Is that not good news? Is it, is it not good news to know that our God is not neutral? Amen. That he's against evil? And if you want to know more about that, you can read the book of Revelation. There's going to come a time when God's going to rip evil right out of this world. That's going to be a great day when that happens. That's some good news. So, so really, even everything we have to say really is good news. Even, even when we talk about wrath and the judgment of God, even that, is, even that is good news, if you understand. So how did Jesus declare the good news? Let's go back and use, again, the ultimate preacher as our example. The Gospels say that Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom of God. When Jesus began his ministry, the gospel writers say that he began to preach the kingdom of God is near. Or some versions say the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here, in other words. The kingdom of God is here. Jesus declared the coming of the kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? Well, the word kingdom could just mean authority. Maybe that's a better word for us to understand. Authority. You see, this world, as some of the brethren have already taught us this week. This world has come under the influence of a dark power. And that dark power has spread rebellion throughout this world. And what the Gospels tell us and show us is that the Son of God left heaven, put on a human body, and he entered right into Satan's domain, and he planted the flag of the kingdom on planet earth. And he said, the kingdom's here. It's here. It's right here. And ever since that time, the kingdom of God has been growing and expanding and advancing. And Satan's kingdom has been suffering defeat after defeat. It started there on the cross where he spoiled principalities and powers. Amen. The kingdom of God is here. Jesus was not a premillennial dispensationalist. He didn't say the kingdom's going to come someday. He said it's here. Now there's more to come in the, in the future. He's going to come. He's going to consummate our kingdom. And the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever. There's more to come. But, but it's here now. Amen. The kingdom is evident in the lives of people who submit to the king. Amen. Who bow the knee and obey the king. So Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom. The good news is that you can be in it. You can be a part of this kingdom. You can be a part of God's program. You can be involved in God's purpose. And experience all the blessings of God's reign. So really, what we have to declare to tell people now, as C.S. Lewis uh, wrote in Mere Christianity, he said, you got to choose sides. That's what we tell people. Choose sides. The kingdom's here. The kingdom's advancing by violence, Jesus said. You've got to choose sides. You've got to declare your allegiance to one side or the other. And someday, of course, he's going to come again and then everybody's choice is going to be made known. Good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus preached about the kingdom, so should we. There needs to be more preaching today about the kingdom of God. Now when Jesus spoke to the crowds, he usually preached about the kingdom through the use of parables. A parable is literally a comparison. And Jesus would often begin a sermon by saying, the kingdom of God is like, and then he would preach a parable. He would speak a parable to the crowds. Some of the most famous parables are about the kingdom of God, like a man went out to sow his seed. Or the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Very, very small, but you plant it, it gets really large. 
Or the kingdom of God is like a drag net, which caught all kinds of fish. Some were good, some were bad. And when the net was pulled ashore, the fish were separated out. All these parables of the kingdom that Jesus told. Whenever Jesus spoke to the crowds, the text says he didn't speak to them without using a parable. Now, I've noticed that a lot of people, even, even preachers, are confused about parables. Most people today think that Jesus told parables like sermon illustrations. You all, you've all heard a preacher use a sermon illustration. He'll say, you know, this is like the time I went walking my dog and this happened, you know, and he makes some kind of comparison. And some people think that's all the, the parables were, were just these elaborate sermon illustrations to help the people understand the truth. Well, it's not that simple. And all you got to do is read the text. You find out why he spoke to them in parables. You see, a parable has, is like a two-edged sword. For us today, we have the inside view. We know what he was talking about. Can you imagine being in the crowd that day by the sea, and you come to hear Jesus, you know, and you've heard this for the first time, you've never heard this before, and Jesus stands up to preach, and this is what he says. A man went out to sow his seed. And some of the seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And some fell on uh, rocky soil, and it grew up a little bit at first, but then, you know, didn't have any root. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up choked plants. Some fell on good soil, produced a crop 30, 60, 100 times. Let everyone who has an ear, let him hear. That's the sermon for the day. And, and you would go away, and say, what does it mean? Now, when Jesus got with his disciples, he told them the meaning. He said, blessed are you because... You, you have the inside view. You see, here's, here's the thing. There are some truths that cannot be learned unless we are closely following Jesus. Amen. Disciples get the inside view. You see, Jesus looked at the crowds. He knew that most of those people didn't really have any interest in following him. So he spoke to them in parables, and they went away with big question marks over their heads. But for people who were really interested in becoming his disciples, then he would explain it to them. Amen. And there are some truths. Now, some of you who preach, here, here's how this applies, okay? For those of you who do preach on a regular basis or have been preaching, we've all been discouraged by people who don't seem to be listening, by people who don't get it. And most of us are not even telling parables, you know? We work very hard to help people understand, and they still don't understand. It's because they're blind. It's because they're really not interested in following Jesus. They may be interested in religion. They may be interested in friendships. They may be interested in having God on their side for some reason. But they're not interested in taking up their cross. And I've learned that people like that are blind. Now, we still preach to them, and we hope that they will repent. But the Word of God can also be a judgment. So Jesus spoke about the word, uh, about the kingdom of God. He used, he used parables. Folks, the gospel has power. We don't need to come up with a lot of bells and whistles in the church today to attract people. I have found that people are attracted by the truth. We need to place our confidence in the gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation. The poverty of modern preaching comes from a lack of faith in the gospel. The gospel isn't preached because people don't really think it's the power of God. If we just preach the gospel, there are people waiting to hear. How beautiful are the feet of those who... You want beautiful feet? Preach the gospel. People can go a lot of other places to hear about the family or finances or current events. Only the church has the gospel to proclaim. Isn't it both strange and wonderful that God has entrusted us with the gospel? Do you know that angels don't get to preach the gospel? But you do. And if, you, if you're the kind of person that's a little bit timid and you're having trouble maybe communicating to a friend that's not a Christian or a, even a family member that's not a Christian and you don't really know how to broach the subject, you know, and, and you're a little bit intimidated about sharing your faith, maybe they'll get angry, something like that. One of the best things that you can do in that situation is to just be a witness. You know what a witness is? A witness is someone that just tells people what they've seen and heard. And sometimes the best preaching is just you going to your unsafe family member and saying, you know what, I just need to tell you what Jesus has done in my life. He's really changed my life. And then living that out in front of them. 
You may not be the, the kind of person that has a real logical mind and you can argue with three points, you know, and, and, and make it like that, but you can live the gospel. And when you have opportunity, you can tell people what you've seen and heard. And sometimes that's more powerful than any amount of reasoned argument in the pulpit. So we've considered the presentation of preaching and the power and illumination of the Spirit, the content of preaching, the good news of the kingdom. But preaching also has intent as well as content. You know, when you read the Bible, when you read the Bible, you will notice that the Bible is trying to do something in your life. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that the Bible is not just giving you information? It's, the Bible is not like reading a, a, a C++ manual. It's not just giving you the facts. It's, not, it's trying to do something in your life. It's trying to change you. It's trying to change your thinking. It's trying to change your heart. The, the stuff that's in the scriptures is trying to do something in our lives, and preaching is like that. Preaching has intent. Preaching is not just for your information. Pre the goal, preaching has a goal, and that goal is to change the lives of people, to bring repentance, to, to help people to think differently and to live differently. So I want to talk a little bit about the goals of preaching. Preaching is not just giving passive information. Jesus, when he preached, he wanted to confront people. He wanted them to change. For example, Jesus told the parable of the prodigal son to confront the religious leader's attitude about whom they considered to be sinners. God rejoices when sinners repent, and so should you. That was the message. The famous Sermon on the Mount was really Jesus confronting the Jews' religion. They, they had an external religion. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. It's about the heart. Now, there is a view of preaching in the past that has been popular, even in our Christian church circles, that views preaching sort of like, you know, the Joe Friday version. Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Just give people the information, and that's all we need to do. And a lot of preaching has been academic for that reason. We just kind of just dump information on people's laps and, and hope that they, in, in fact, some people believe it's wrong to even make any kind of application because, you know, that's the Spirit's job. He's supposed to make the application. But see, that's not biblical. The Scripture's trying to do something in our lives. When Jesus preached, he was trying to confront people. He was calling them to a decision, to make a decision, make a change, to repent, follow me. And our preaching today needs to confront people. We need to call for a decision. We need, I'm, not, I'm not talking about having a decision time necessarily. I'm talking about you know, making the application, seeking to change people's minds and lives. We shouldn't be afraid to make personal application. The gospel should persuade. And if we don't do that, we're not really preaching. Jesus always sought to apply the messages to the people. Uh, there's one other, before I get into this even deeper, there's, there's one other misunderstanding about preaching that I feel I need to correct. There was a scholar named C.H. Dodd, and some of you have no idea who that is, but C.H. Dodd was a scholar who wrote a lot about the New Testament, and he said that there's two kinds of preaching. There's preaching the gospel, and then there's teaching. And he became very influential, influenced a whole generation of preachers, and Alexander Campbell you probably heard that name, also said a similar thing. He said that in the church, what we do in the church is we teach. We teach people how to live out the Christian life. The preaching is for the unbelievers. Some of you have heard this. Some of you have heard this. We teach Christians, we preach to unbelievers. We preach the facts of the gospel to unbelievers. Then we tell the believers how to live it out. C.H. Dodd said that, Alexander Campbell said that. A whole generation of preachers adopted that. It led to some very destructive practices in preaching. For example, there are some people that have gone to church for years and never heard the gospel. All they hear is in churches, you better shape up. You better do this, and you better do that. And there's a whole generation of people in our churches that are legalists because that's all the kind of preaching they've ever heard. It's just duty, 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 duty. They've never heard the gospel. Now, I'm not saying that unbelievers don't need to hear the gospel. Of course, unbelievers need to hear the gospel, but so do believers. We need to hear it over and over again. Tell me the old, old story. Tell, me, tell it to me again. 
We need to hear it again and again. So there's no distinction in the New Testament between preaching and teaching. You don't find that distinction in the New Testament. Sometimes it says Jesus preached. Sometimes it says he taught. There's, there's no distinction there between those two things. So I wanted to just, for what it's worth, get that straight in our minds. So what is the goals? What are the goals of preaching? What is the intent of preaching? I'm going to focus here as I give you these things. I'm going to focus mainly on preaching to believers. Most, I think all of us here are believers. Isaiah was talking to the people of God. There is a place for evangelistic preaching to people who are not believers. But I'm going to, to focus mainly on preaching to people who are believers. What is the intent of preaching? First of all, according to our text in Isaiah, preaching is to encourage God's people. Look back at your text. To comfort all who mourn. To grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. That's the goal of preaching, to encourage God's people. We often think of the prophets as, as, as men who disrupted and disputed and disturbed. But the prophets, Isaiah himself, also had a ministry of comfort, of encouragement. Bind up the brokenhearted. Encourage the people of God. There is a real need today for encouraging people. Folks, we live in some very evil times. It's hard out there. And many of God's people are very, very discouraged. And we need some encouragement. And that's, that's part of the reason why we have these renewals, is just to encourage each other. Because it can be very, very difficult. I, I don't buy into that theology that says that Christians ought to be happy all the time. We're not happy all the time. It's great to be happy, but sometimes God's servants become discouraged. Elijah got discouraged. It's a common thing today. Now, we don't despair. We don't grieve as those without hope, but sometimes we need the jewel of hope shined up a bit. And that's the ministry of preaching and teaching. Preaching should make our hope clear. It should help God's people to lift up their heads for our redemption is drawing near. Amen. Now I know that in a, in, even in a meeting like this, I know that there are some of you who have had a hard year and you've, you're discouraged. And you may, you know, it may be something very private that you don't like to talk about. It may be some, something, a wound that you got in ministry. Sometimes ministering to the church, they can beat you up more than anybody out in the world can beat you up. I know that. And there, be, there may be somebody here that's, that's discouraged. So how can I encourage you tonight? It'd be silly for me to talk about encouraging without actually encouraging you. So how can I encourage you? Just, I think just one thing popped out at me when I thought about the theme for this renewal. As, we talk, as we've talked about these prophecies of Christ there's something about God there that I think we can see that can encourage us tonight. The faithfulness of God. Amen. I just want you to think about how throughout the ages, God said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. I'm going to send my son. He's going to do this. He's going to say this. He's going to accomplish this. Did he fail at any point? Has God not been completely trustworthy to fulfill everything that he's ever promised that he would do? Has, have any of these prophecies fallen to the ground unfulfilled? No. God has been completely faithful. Everything that he said he would do, he has done. Now, I know there are still some things yet to come. But as we look out into the future, we can know that there's hope for the future because God has been faithful in the past. So if you're discouraged, I just want to remind you that God is faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. He's always kept his word. He's always been trustworthy. When you put your faith in God, you hope in God, you won't be disappointed. So I hope, I hope that's some, some encouragement for you tonight. The faithfulness of God. Secondly, preaching will also strengthen the people of God. Look back again at the words of Isaiah. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. God's people should be like oak trees with deep roots, able to weather the storms. You know, God is glorified by strong Christians, not by weak Christians. Amen. 
Our strength comes from the Lord, not from ourselves. But we can be strong because we have a strong God. And it is shameful that churches are often filled with weak, undependable, easily tempted people, blown here and there by every wind of doctrine. You know, someone has said that American Christianity is a mile wide and each inch deep. And if that's true, that's very, very sad. We need some deep roots in the church today. Paul said that pastors and teachers are given to the church to make the church strong and mature so that we are not blown and tossed around by every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4. You know, many of Jesus' most important and precious words were spoken to his disciples just before he would leave them to go to the cross. He wanted to strengthen them. They were often weak and undependable. And Jesus said things like this, I go to prepare a place for you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I am the vine and you are the branches. All those things were intended to strengthen the disciples who were often so weak in themselves. And we too are weak in our natural selves, but we can become strong through the word of Christ. You know, I can tell what kind of preaching a congregation has been hearing by the condition of the people. If you've got weak, ignorant, uncommitted, undisciplined people in a church... One of the reasons may be is because there's been a lack of strong preaching. You show me people who are grounded and mature and strong and committed and dependable, and at the center of that church, there's probably a strong preaching ministry. Pre the Word of God can make us strong. It can help us to grow those deep roots. That's one of the main reasons why we preach. And finally, the goal of preaching is to motivate God's people. I'm almost done. Isaiah said, then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. In other words, God's people, when they are made strong, will be motivated to do God's work in this world. Amen. Preaching should not only make God's people strong, it should direct them to go out into the world and do God's will. In fact, the strength is given so that we can do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. There is some work for us to do, folks. Preaching is not only a part of the work itself. It is to motivate the church to work till Jesus comes. Again, we turn to the ministry of our Lord. Jesus' preaching always moved people into some kind of action. And I think of one famous example that I'll give you. Jesus told the parable, the famous parable of the Good Samaritan to move a man to actually love his neighbor. You remember the story. The man came to Jesus and it says he wanted to justify himself. He knew what the word of God said, but he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to actually love his neighbor. So Jesus told the story about the man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among thieves. And that story that we know so well was given so that a man would apply the word of God and actually do the will of God and stop and help his neighbor. And folks, there are people in our churches that hear the word of God week after week after week and don't apply it and don't obey it and don't do his will. And there's a part of all of us, that flesh, that old man, that doesn't want to do the will of God. And we have to discipline that part and we have to take every thought captive and we have to walk in the spirit and put to death the deeds of the flesh and do the will of God and crucify that old man in order to do the will of God. We're not here at this renewal just to fill our minds intellectually with a lot of Bible stuff. We are here to be strengthened so that we can leave here and continue to do the will of God. Amen. Preaching, should move, preaching is not to just make people intellectual, it is to make people obedient. And that's not legalism. Legalism is saying that I'm accepted because I'm obedient. I'm talking about being obedient because we're accepted. And the grace of God is teaching us, isn't it, to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live upright and godly lives in this present age. Let me find a way to conclude. The Lord needs preachers today. Those who will boldly speak his word. I'm not just talking about pastors behind a pulpit. I'm talking about all of God's people being ready to give an answer for the hope that is within them. Folks, in a secular culture like ours, we need to be ready and able to speak a word for the Lord. We need to be wise and bold. We cannot afford these days to be intimidated. Remember that they cannot believe unless they hear, and they can't hear unless someone preaches to them. Someone once said that God had only one son and he made him a preacher. Amen. 
If you want to be more like Jesus, be ready, ready, willing, and able to speak the truth in love. And remember to pray for those of us who do preach regularly, that utterance may be given to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel.